Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the chance to gather. I just uh, look forward so much to what we're going to do over the next couple of minutes. And I pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified, that you'd be lifted up, you'd be exalted. Thank you for what we experienced last night with Sherman and Sharon, Sharon, just their story and how you uh, have been involved in a very intimate level with them and their marriage and their family for for many, many years. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for his passion for the word of God, his passion for the scripture. And thank you, Lord, that he's, he's not a cultural Christian. He's a Christian. He's a biblical Christian. So, Lord, use this uh, time today for your glory and your glory alone. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen and amen. Amen. Sherman Smith, come on forward. And, uh, and again, if you have a question that you want to write out, uh, we'll collect those and we'll be going from there. Chris, tell us, uh, is this going to work? Is this going to work fine? Okay, you're in good shape. Hey, Chris, thank you for your work on this. You're, you're a blessing <laughs> to us. Hey, Sherman, uh, let's start with, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to try to repeat last night. Okay. Because the guys can go to YouTube and everybody that was there and can see, can, can see you share your testimony mm -hmm. and some of the stuff. But, but give me a reflection from last night. What was God doing in your life, even last night? And what did, what did you sense God was speaking to us through you last night? Well, I just think as the body of Christ, God wants us to encourage each other like he says in Hebrews. Let us consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds, not forsaking the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as we see the day drawing near. So that's what I just saw it as an opportunity to get in the huddle with other believers and give a word of encouragement, a word that may challenge, a word that may warn, and a word of instruction. And so that's what it was. And like we started out last night, I said, the goal is that God will be glorified, the body of Christ will be edified, and Satan will be terrified. And so that was, that was the plan. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what we want God to do. Oh, man, those three things happen big time. That's good. I got to steal that. That's a good one. Go that's ahead. a good one, man. Go ahead. I probably stole it from someone too. So. <laughs> God will be glorified, the body of Christ will be edified, and Satan will be terrified. All right. All right, we heard it here first. We'll give Sherman credit for it, but yeah, I'm going to use that one. And, and Damien, I, Damien, I whispered yesterday. <laughs> Damien's writing it down now. <laughs> That's good. And 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 tell us. I mean, uh, my we were so impressed with Sharon last night. It's my bride, man. That was your bride. bride. And and so Jana went up and she said that was so cool. And she, and I don't know if you if you if she told you this, but Jana goes, you were so natural. She goes, that was my first time doing that. That's right. So, so, were you proud of her? What oh, man, I've been proud of my wife, you know. <laughs> but definitely that was the first time she did it in that type of format. Uh, she's got a lot in her heart when it comes to that story about dealing. I mean, my wife was all in from the beginning, you know. I mean, when I came to her to tell her what was going on, she was the one that had to perk me up. She had to encourage me because I was just feeling so down about certain aspects of the story. She said, hey, our family just got bigger. She was positive. Let's go meet our grandkids. You know, she was excited and, and very protective of Dylan. You know, she, she took on a mother image for Dylan. She wanted, you know, she wanted him to get the full expression of what it's like to find your father. And she was going to make sure she wasn't going to be a hindrance to that process. Mm -hmm. So she was awesome. She loved, and watching the movie, my wife may have watched the thing 50, 60 times. Every time if it comes on TV, she's watching the story. Cause she, and she, she loves to talk about it. So, you know, this is my wife and, you know, and so I, it's funny. My wife said somebody came up to her last night and said, boy, you loved your husband, even though he was unfaithful to you when you were married. So we said, well, that guy didn't get the story. He didn't understand, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I said, no, that, that, that was a high school situation. I didn't even know Sharon. I didn't even know Sharon. So, but in spite of that, I will tell you this, Rod, I had a, a, a friend of mine who's a pastor in Northern California and I called him, told him the story. And he said, I knew Sharon was special. He said, but man, this proves, he said, I want you to know something, Sherman. He said, I have people in my church who have had the same situation like yours and their marriages have ended over that. A, a guy finding out that he fathered a child even before he got married. He said, marriages have ended over that. He said, so don't take that for granted mm. that your wife is the way she was. So she, Sharon's awesome, man. She, she's absolutely awesome. God's grace. I get to see God's grace in her. Heck, even before that in our marriage, going on 45 years, she's given me a lot of grace. No question. 
So we know Dylan calls you dad. Yeah. But I actually had someone come up to me last night and say, so what does Dylan call Sharon? And she told me, but tell them what, they, what he calls her. Mama Sharon. Mama Sharon. Mama Sharon. Well, you know, so Dylan, he got his biological mom. He got his adoptive mom. And so, you know, so she's Mama Sharon. And so. So he's got three mamas. He's got three mamas, right. <laughs> yeah. That is really special. Yeah. And, and Sharon loves him. And one time we were praying and, you know, praying for Dylan and all the other stuff. And, and we got through praying. Sharon said, I, I feel like he is my son. You know, she said, that's, that's how she looks at him. She, she looks at him like, he is my son. And that's, that's, a, that's and, and our two kids, our, our two biological kids are not threatened by that at all. They, they love it. And that's the thing we didn't talk about last night, how my kids responded to it. My daughter, Siobhan, and my son, they were, the first question they asked me was, how is mom? Hmm. First question, how's mom doing? I said, mom's great. Mom's great. And they followed her track. And, they, and my, my daughter, first thing she said was, I always wanted an older brother. That's what she said. And then my younger son, he, you know, it was the same thing. He said, it's cool to have an older brother. Yeah. So they've been, they've been cool. Tell us, tell us about your, your kids. I mean, we know about dealing stories, but tell us about your other two kids. Oh, man, my daughter, Siobhan. My daughter, Siobhan, is um, 42 years old, single, um, been teaching first grade for 21 years. She's a heck of a teacher. She gets teacher of the year, teacher of the month. She's, she's awesome, you know. Um, loves the Lord, you know, and just, uh, you know, just beautiful young lady. You know, I know she has a desire. She, you know, really wanted to be married. You know, I, I told her I know you would make an awesome wife, an awesome mother, but, you know, for whatever reason, you know, she was not going to marry no knucklehead, so, you know, so she, she's still single, and that's good. Smart. I'd rather, smart woman. Yeah, I told her the only thing, worst thing than being, not being married is being married to the wrong guy. <clears throat> so she's, so she's good, man, and love her. Yeah. And then my son, Sherman, John Thomas, he lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have three grandkids with him, and, uh, you know, he's my namesake. You know, everybody, when, when they start talking about somebody looks like me, everybody will look at him and say, oh, man, you know, I can tell that's, you can't mistake that this is your son. So, but, uh, so my son, Sherman, like I say, he's 40 years old, and that's my guy. So, and my, and my son, Sherman, was the one that encouraged Dylan when this story came out to spend time with me. He said, man, you need to spend time with him. When my son, Sherman, got married, I was the best man in his wedding. And so he blessed me with that honor and standing next to him. And so I have a great relationship with all my kids. And they showed me grace, you know, do, during this whole process. Because one thing, they weren't surprised because I shared my stuff with them. And that's one thing I said when I talked to men, I said, we need to share our scars with our kids. You know, it shows empathy and also shows humility. You know, and so humility, like I said last night, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not denying your strengths, but being honest about your weaknesses and your failures. And I share my failures with my kids. You know, I said, man, hey, I didn't do it the right way growing up. You know, I was disobedient. I was sexually immoral. Man, I did all that stuff. So I just shared it with them. So when the story about dealing came out, I had to go to them and say, ah, you know, I kind of lied to you a little bit. I told you I was this guy. No, no you know, and my kids, they showed me grace. And what they say is your battle scars, when you share your battle scars with someone else, and someone learns from it, that battle scar becomes a beauty mark. They see that battle scar as a beauty mark because they learn from your failures. And that's why I think we have to be, have enough humility to share our failures with our kids. That man, they're not going to beat us up over. I think they'll respect you for it. Say, hey, you know what, man, I messed up. I didn't do some things right. They'll come to you. My kids come to me with stuff because they're not afraid to come to me and say, oh, he's perfect. He doesn't understand. Oh, I, I tell my kids, I understand a lot more than you think I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been out there a little bit, you know, so, but yeah, I got, including Dealer, man, I got two beautiful kids, my, my, my daughter and my son, man. When, when, Sharon, I, when Sharon was pregnant and we didn't know it was a girl, I told her, I, I hope it's a girl. You know, I want, I hope we have a girl first and God I, bless me with and my daughter. I, and I said, I said the same prayer. I knew I'd be rough on a boy. Oh, so man. God, give me a girl. And he did. And Damon, you mm -hmm. girl first. Greg Griffin, girl first. Bobby <clears throat> Belger, girl first. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not against seven boys first, no. but, but some of us need a girl first. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had all brothers and never had a girl in the house. So I just said, man, this would be cool. You know, have a daughter, you know, a protector, you know. And that's what I told my daughter as she grew up. Man, I said, hey, even as she's an adult, I said, I can protect. I want to protect you. I'm your father. I want to protect you. But I can only protect you as much as you'll let me. And that's what I had to tell her. She got older. 
you know, when she went to college and was on her own, you know, I said, I can only protect you as much as you'll let me. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to protect you from the wolves out there. You know, I want to I protect you. And so it's funny, man. She, my daughter's 30 some years old calling me up and asking for advice. I said, well, I, all, all I can tell you is here's what I think. Because when they get a certain age, I don't tell them what to do. You know, my kid's 40, 42, almost 50. I don't tell them what to do. You know, now I'm a, more of a, a friend, a counselor. Hey, here's what I think. You know, you have to make that decision. Yeah. Tell us about the grandkids. And, and obviously you found out you had more grandkids. Sure uh, so tell us about them. And, and uh, I told Sherman last night, I whispered to him, I said, how old is your youngest? He says he's six, six. Mm -hmm. and he's the one at the very end of that segment where just breaks out a huge grin. He's got the <laughs> cutest smile, yeah, man. Something. That kid's got energy. Oh, I can tell yeah. he's got energy. Oh, plenty. So tell me about oh, those man. grandkids. Well, I tell you what, first about the grandkids, you know, it's a promise that God gives us in Psalms 128, you know, when he says, and you will see your children's children. I, I thought about that, you know, when God revealed to me that I had a son, and I, I thought about Psalms 128, that's one of the last mm -hmm. verses there, and it says, and you will see your children's children, a promise that he gives to a man that fears the Lord. I said, God, you're fulfilling a promise that you gave me, that I get to see. I knew I had three grandkids, but I get to see my other four grandkids through a child of mine. So that was a promise. So, <clears throat> you know, my son, when he got married, my, my son, Sherman, when he got married, uh, his wife that he married, she had a, a child when she was in high school. And so when Sherman was a senior in high school, his wife-to-be uh, had, had a child. And so when Sherman mm -hmm. first got engaged, to her name is Takara. When he got engaged to Takara, he said, Dad, how do you feel about me marrying someone that always, already has a child? I said, that's on you. That's your decision, you know. Um, you know, I said, it could be tough, but it can be great. And so Sherman, when he got married, he had a wife and he had a daughter, she, you know, Destiny. She's in grad school at George, University of Georgia right now. Beautiful young lady, man. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And we saw how God used my son in that relationship because Takara never thought she would ever get married. Who's going to marry somebody that has a child? But, man, my son loves it. And she, Takara, is beautiful, man. And, and she's like Sharon. I, she reminds me so much of Sharon that just mm -hmm. I, I laugh when I see the two of them together. But so we have our 21-year-old granddaughter uh, at the University of Georgia. Beautiful. And then we have Dylan's oldest son, little Dylan. He's 21 years old. He's at the uh, University, uh, Indiana University. And uh, he was playing football. And um, he, he started out at Miami University and ended up transferring to Indiana University when his dad went there. And then he has a medical situation, so they've medical him, so he won't play any more football. But he'll graduate in the spring. He's smart. He's going to graduate in the spring, and he'll go on to life after football. And so then we have Desan. Uh, that's my next oldest grandson. I believe Desan's 19 years old. And Desan's a true freshman at Indiana University. He's a stud. He's the stud on that program right now. He's the highest uh, rated recruit that they've ever had at Indiana University. And so, and he's a, a true freshman, and he's... Committed, committed to Ohio State initially. Yeah, committed. And yeah. decommitted. Yeah, because so, yeah, he won. We're talking legit here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he committed to Ohio State. I mean, he had, uh, his uh, junior year, he had more offers than any other junior in the country. He, he had numerous offers. Everyone was offering this cat. You know, so, but he committed to Ohio State. Dad ends up in Indiana University. His older brother, his uh, younger brother's there. Uh, his older brother's going to go there. And he just said, well, I want to play with my brother. Dylan's there. there. He said, I want to go play with, my, play with my brothers. And the bonus is my dad will be there. Because Dylan had told his boys when they start saying they wanted to go to IU, he said, nah, don't come here because of me because I might leave. He said, if I get a chance to be a head coach, I'm going to take it. So the boys knew when they, they came there that there's a possibility their dad may leave. And he did. He ended up leaving going to Notre Dame. So Desan is there, and then there's Day. Uh, he's, Day is 17 years old, 18 years old. Day will be, Day's in his senior year, he's committed to, he's the first one to commit to Indiana University. He started the whole thing rolling, and now he's decommitted, and he's going to the University of Cincinnati. Dad's not there, brother, you know, so he, he's decommitted. He's a stud, too. So, he's, <laughs> so Dylan got something in his, Dylan, man, those boys are something else. And so, uh, and then there's my twin grandsons, Lou Sherman, they're the nine-year-olds. They were preemies. And, uh, you know, and I tell you what, I, I can't remember how young they were when they got born. All I know is they were, you know, Nick U for months. And they were so small, man, you could hold them in your hand like that. 
And I just look at when I see those two guys, uh, Isaiah and Sherman, and that, uh, you know, that's his name. Because when I, when, I when I had my first son, I, I, I told my father, I said, my first child, I'm going to name after you. Because I love my dad that much. I said, I'm going to name after you. But Sharon and I had this S thing going by the end. It was Sharon and Sherman. Our daughter was Siobhan. I said, ah, man, I can't name, you know, we got to keep this S thing going. <laughs> so, so I named my first son Sherman, Sherman John Thomas. So my father's name is John Thomas. So, so I gave him my father's um, name as his middle name. So then what my son, when Sherman had his child, he named one of his sons. His son is Sherman, named him Sherman also. So Sherman John Thomas. So we, we got that going there. So I got Isaiah and I got Sherman, my twin grandsons. So, and then, the and then little one, DM. The full what's, what's his name? DM, D-I-E-M. That's how he spelled. So Dylan's and my daughter-in-law, I got to talk about her too. Uh, Dylan's wife, Darnell, man, she's beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful lady. She's Great. in the movie. She's, she's in the movie, man. She's something. She is, she is special. My sons are blessed, man. They got beautiful brides, man. They, they got beautiful women in their life. So Dylan and them got all the D things going. They, you know, Dylan, Darnell, <laughs> Dylan, Desan, Day, DM. You know, so they, he got the D thing going. So, um, but man, blessed to have seven beautiful yeah. grandkids. <laughs> blessed, man. So cool. I told the story last night, little, the little Sherm story. Let's, let's repeat that, because that story's a... Yeah, that's that's a cool, cool story. And we visited with this in, <clears throat> yesterday from the airport. I wanted to hear the version. He says, well, Sharon tells it better, but I wish <laughs> she was here to share it, too, because you guys together. Yeah. It's a, it's just a cool story. Yeah. Well, just, you know, after I recruited Dylan, Dylan had a picture of himself in his dorm on a on a poster and guys were walking here. And I think it, some of it was during the time when I was there and they didn't know. And then some of it was after I left, guys would come in and say, you're, that's your dad, you know, isn't that your dad? He said, no, that's Coach Sherm, you know, um, he recruited me, and uh, no, that's your dad. You know, they, they just look at the picture, and so they weren't buying it, and they would just call him Little Sherm. So, so we'd be out on the practice field or whatever, and they, I wouldn't hear it, but they would say, hey, Little Sherm, you know, you need to come over here. So they just kept, you know, just kept pitting, man, that, that's your father. Years would go by, people would look at that picture and say, hey, man, is that your dad? No, that's not, that's Coach Sherm. No, man, that's, that's not your dad. So, <laughs> so, so we had that going. And then when I got, uh, in 2014, when Dylan came out to Seattle to do an internship. With, for you. For me, yeah. And so we're there, and it's during training camp. And it was a year after we, we had just won the Super Bowl. So, man, it's a big deal. And he's out there. And he walked in there, and guys start saying the same thing. Marshawn Lynch. And Marshawn was calling him Little Sherm. You know, hey, little Sherm, you know, and so he, he said, I mean, you guys walk alike, talk like your mannerisms. They're going through all this stuff. And hey, I'm not paying any attention to this stuff. You know, I said, well, why would I think that he's my son? And so the funniest part was when Coach Pat Rule had an office right across from mine. And Pat is an animated, funny guy. And he, he comes up and says, look here, man, there's absolutely no way you guys cannot be father and son. No way. He said, this is crazy. He said, don't even. And so I, Pat, get out of here, man. You're crazy. And, you know, you tell us we all look alike and all that stuff. So just bleed it, you know. So get out of here, man. So, and that, and that was it. So people on the field, Pete Carroll said something to him. Pete Carroll said, it's crazy, Head, head man. coach of the Seahawks. Head coach. He, he said, man, I'm just, I just watch you two guys. You're just too, he said, this crazy. And somebody said, there must be something in the water in Youngstown because, man, you guys just look too much alike and act too much alike. And so that, that's, so that people were calling him a little shirt. So what did Pat Rule say when he found out that his 2014 statement? You know, it's funny. You, you mentioned Pat Rule. He, Pat called me. I, I got to get, get on his, his case. He, he just called me the other day, and, um, and I wanted to talk to him about it because we had talked before it came out because I had retired before that, and then we hadn't talked for a while. And so I wanted to talk to him when he called me the other day, last week sometime, just to, to say something to him. Because when I called him back to leave him a message, he called me and I didn't, it went to voicemail and I left him a message. I said, yeah, I can't wait to talk to you about dealing. About this. Yes, I can't wait to talk to you about dealing. And so I haven't heard back from the guy, so I'm going to get on his case today. There you go. I should call him right now. <laughs> Wake up, Pat. Hey, so we had a really cool conversation last night with Chris Smith. Chris played at Notre Dame, played here with the Chiefs. Uh, they met for the first mm -hmm. last name Smith. Yes, he was yes. from Cincinnati. I mean, there's all these crazy connections. But he mentioned that he is really dear friends with Theotis Brown, mm -hmm. who Sherman played with in Seahawk days. Yeah. 
Uh, and you right. haven't seen Theodos since 1983. Yes. And, and Theodos is going to come tomorrow night to First Baptist and see Sherman for the first well, time sure since 83. He told yeah. me, I got a note this morning, he's coming. It's, oh, my goodness, man. So yeah. isn't that cr- and, and the movie's connecting you to people that, mm-hmm. I mean, talk about this piece because oh, it's really man. crazy. That's, that's, that's crazy, man. Just see Theo. Theo came out to Seattle. Man, like I said, we were teammates for a couple of years. I just blew my knee out, had a knee injury. And so we, I think we traded for Theotis. And he came there, and I mean, he helped pick the team up. And, you know, we called him Bigfoot, you know, because his brother had some big feet, man. So we <laughs> messed with him. But he's, he's a heck of a running back. Great guy. Had, like I said, haven't seen him since early 80s. So to be able to see him on tomorrow night, it's just, that's a blessing. Yeah. Because we were good friends with he and his wife, and you know football separates us. And you know some guys you stay in contact with some guys, and some guys like tomorrow. Well, Theo and I haven't seen each other in over thirty some years, but you'll see when we get together, man, it'd be like we, you know, nothing's been lost because we have that relationship that we have from playing, being teammates and stuff. So mm. I look forward to being able to see the guy. Now you've been part of great teams, great people, playing days, coaching days. Um, you and I share some friendships, mm-hmm. Jeff Kemp, Steve Largent, Ron Coder. Oh, we talked about Coder oh, yesterday. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, talk, uh, and I don't know Eddie George, but just talk about the influence of those men on your life. And you mentioned something last night about kind of who you hang with is who you become. Oh, talk about this. I know God blessed me in my, in my Christian walk. God had me in the right place at the right time with the right people. You know, uh, Ken Hutcherson, first of all, when I prayed, God, I need somebody to show me. You know, and that's Ken Hutchinson was that guy that God used. And I think that's an example that can encourage all of us. They're, everyone's looking for Jesus. You know, the Lazarus, I mean, the story in Luke 19 of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was and said people got in the way. So he had to go climb a sycamore tree. And I always said that Ken Hutchinson was my sycamore tree. He helped me to see Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so God had him in my life. And I always say, man, God only knows where I would be without Hutch being that example for me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I try to encourage men to say, man, somebody's looking to see Jesus. Are they looking at you? You might be that sycamore tree that that makes a difference in their life. You could be that guy. I know, you know, Hutch was a sycamore tree for me. I needed a sycamore tree. I was critical of men that were getting in the way when I wanted to see Jesus. Then I became that man (laughs) that got in the way. You know, I became that guy. And so, man, it really motivated me once Hutch told me, Hey, man, stop telling people you're a Christian. <laughs> you're making it tough on us out here. So, I said, man, you know, I, I saw the, what I had become, and it really changed my life. So I thank God for Ken Hutcherson, just the, just the impact he had on me, how he lived it before me, how he loved me. You know, he wasn't preaching to me. I would go to him and confess my stuff to him, and he would laugh, man. He'd laugh at me, you laugh with me, and then love on me and give me the word. He was like Jesus with the woman caught in adultery. He didn't condemn me, but he would say, go and sin no more, you know. Yeah. But he just loved on me. And so that's why I think when he came to me, I was, my heart was open. And so, like I said, guys like that. I was out in Seattle with guys like Jim Zorn, strong Christians, Steve Largent strong Christian. Norm Evans, strong Christians. Dave Brown. God surrounded me with some godly men. I was blessed, man. I was surrounded with some men that that were serious about walking with Jesus. And they impacted you. Oh, absolutely. They were game changers. They were game changers. All of them. Every last one of them. You know, even in my disobedience, these guys influenced me because I was convicted by their lifestyle. I was convicted. I knew what I wanted to be you know, I was saying what I wanted to be, but I, my feet just weren't going where, where I was saying in my head. The, the, the difference between 18 inches makes a difference, you know. So when it got to my heart, you know, I said, man, my feet got a little bit different, start acting different. So, but those men, like, said, like, you know, so just those guys. And then just to have the opportunity to influence young men for Christ. You know, like, say, Eddie George, uh, the difference, you know. And you hear the difference you make in their life sometimes after you've coached them. When they come to you and they tell you, you know, coach... You know, Marshawn Lynch, I, I got to tell you Marshawn Lynch story. That's really crazy. When I was in Seattle on Fridays, our meeting day was a little bit different because it's Friday before the game and our meeting time was different. And I would have time to meet with the running backs. And what I started doing, I would have a devotional Friday morning. And I had a group of running backs in that room that were Christians. And so I would say, hey, man, here's what we're going to do the first 10 minutes of the meeting. Well, somebody can share something from the word. And so I had a guy, Justin Forsett was a strong Christian, and um, Leon Washington, we had guys, so 
between the three of us, we would take turns. And so Marshawn would just sit there and listen to him. So something happened later on in the year where we couldn't meet, had that 10 minute meeting. And Marshawn Lynch walks up to me. We'd miss about three or four of them. And Marshawn Lynch walks up to me and he always called me boss man. He said, boss man. He said, man, when are we gonna start having our talks again? Hmm. He said, man, I miss that. And I just know he was just sitting there, man, you don't think he's listening, man, but he was listening. He said, you don't think I'm listening? He said, I'm listening to what you guys are talking about. He said, I might not say anything, but I'm listening. And he came to me and said, when are we going to start, start having our talks again? Wow. So, you know. And if you know who Marshawn Lynch is, that's, uh, that's a statement you wouldn't publicly expect to hear. But privately, he came to you and said, man, this is valuable for me. This is really important for me to hear. Well, he, and, and, and not to even protect him in, in a sense, but he is one of the most misunderstood guys because some people look go. at the outside That's persona. Right. This cat is gold, man. He has a heart of gold. He is smart, intelligent, loving, faithful, giving, all of that stuff. And a great, he was a great football player. I just knew as a running back coach, guys would talk about wanting to play. I said, if it were up to me, Marshawn would never come off the field. He'd play every down. If he could, I, I, you just stay out on the field because he was that good. I thought every time he touched the football, he could score. And so, but giving, oh man, misunderstood. Beautiful guy. Beautiful. I don't care what happens. You know, he got in trouble a little while ago with a DUI. And I texted him. I said, this does not define you. There you go. It doesn't, it doesn't define you. You do too much good stuff, and you're going to continue to do too much good stuff for this to define you. But he's a beautiful guy. Eddie George, that's my guy. You know, so Eddie is the one player that I had that I would tell all my rookies, follow his example. Just do what he does. On the field, off the field. Just follow his example. You'll be okay. Because he just, Eddie, Eddie and Marshawn led in different ways. They were both highly respected in that building. When one of them spoke, everybody listened. You know, Eddie, everybody listened. Marshawn, everybody. But they were just different, and I respected their differences. But Mar Eddie was just, the way he carried himself was a little bit different. And I just said, yeah, man, you know, just follow his example. Mm -hmm. Marshawn was from Oakland, more street, you know, and that was, but that was his deal. But, man, when it came to the team and that stuff, he was all in. Yeah. So uh, he shared last night, 32 years coaching, five high school, five college, 22 National Football League. Just give us a, a picture of each of those seasons of your life and what God was, how he used you at the high school level. And by the way, we're going to be with high school coaches today at lunch. We're going to be with 25 high school coaches here in the city that are going to get some wisdom from him. But high school, college, and then the NFL. Give us, give us a perspective of that. Well, for me, guys, playing professional football was not a childhood dream at all. I wanted, when I left to go to Miami University, I wanted to be a coach. And that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to come back and coach high school. I wanted to be like Coach Knox, the guy that inspired me to be a coach. That's all I wanted to do, high school coaching. So NFL really kind of interrupted my plans. So when my plan career was over with, I didn't stumble at all. It was like, man, great. I get to do what I wanted, and I can get to coach. And so I started out teaching. I put in an application at Lake Washington School District out there in the Seattle area. And um, and I start teaching at uh, Redmond Junior High School, Redmond Middle School. But I coached football at Redmond High School and absolutely loved it. So for five years, I was a high school coach. And um, when I had an opportunity to go to college, I turned it down. The first, first opportunity I got, I said, man, I just want to be a high school coach. And I loved it. I, and I was blessed. In every coaching situation, I was with a great guy. The first coach that I was with, Jim Sampson, out in Seattle, God couldn't have put me with a better guy. I remember Jim. Yes. Yeah, I didn't realize you guys were together. Yes. Isn't that special? Man, love the Lord. He taught me man, how you could coach and have a good time, um, coach kids right, love kids. I mean, he, guys, there's no question. God set me with the right guy in my first coaching job. And I just established how, how we can coach and coach kids the right way, love on them, hold them accountable. So five years of high school, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, the hardest time I had to deal with in high school were parents. It wasn't, it wasn't the kids, it was the parents, <laughs> you know. Hey, it was, it's still true today. I believe, even, I believe, more, so, even more so. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, parents had some, I had to say some of them had some unrealistic expectations, you know, of their child and of us as coaches. You know, so, you know, it was our job to make their son, you know, take an apple and make it into an orange, you know, and say, can't do that, you know, it's kind of hard. So, um, 
But high school coaching, loved it. So then I, my first coaching career uh, opportunity in college came to go back to my alma mater. And Randy Walker was the head coach. Randy Walker and I were teammates in college. So we came into Miami of Ohio at the same time, freshman year. I was a starting quarterback. Randy was a starting tailback. And so Randy went on to coach, and so he gets the head job in Miami, calls me, hey, let's go back to our alma mater and let's get that program back. On the so that's why I left uh, Seattle to go back to Miami of Ohio. And you know, as you know, that's where Sharon, I bet Sharon in college. So we go back to my alma mater, and I coached there for two years. You know, and, and, when, he, and, he, and during that season when he recruited d So, yes. I mean, this is, again, the Lord's connecting dots oh, yeah. here. Big time. Big time. Yeah, we had some friends that were really disappointed that we left Seattle in 89, because it was in, really in 89, but the family didn't move until 90. They were really disappointed. But once, when the Dillon story came out, they called and said, we, we see it now. We understand. We didn't understand then, but we, we see it now. How, and they just saw that. So, wow. so, so, you're, so, so you're at Miami too, and then Illinois Then I go to University three. of Illinois. Three years. I had prayed. Randy was a Christian coach, and I had prayed. I said, God, I, you know, I, I just enjoy coaching for Christian coaches. And Lou Tepper, so Lou Tepper is now, he was the head coach of the University of Illinois. You want to talk about a man that fears the Lord walks with God. This guy, I mean, he was, he was Jim Sampson. You know, he had the passion of Randy Walker. But, man, this cat, he just, and he's still on fire for the Lord and just doing all the things that he does, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I get to go to coach with him. The very first question he asked me in the interview was, why do you coach? First question in the interview. Why do you coach? He said, do you coach to make a living or do you coach to make a difference? And I knew what my answer was. I knew he was a strong Christian. And I, I didn't have to make something up to tell him what I thought he wanted to hear. I said, man, I, I, coach, I, I coach to make a difference. I coach to make a difference. That's why I coach. And I knew, you know, because when you know why you coach, it impacts how you coach. And so I knew why I coached. And so I knew that's what Coach uh, Tepper was all about. So my three years with him, this man, he loved the Lord. He was starting to do things for racial reconciliation back, and that was in the early 90s. He would recruit, and he, if he recruited a white recruit, he would tell a white recruit, during training camp and on the road, you will room with someone of another race. He recruited a black young man during training camp, and when we're on the road, your roommate will be a white person. He said, I want you guys to get to know each other. I, mm -hmm. I, want, I want these to build relationships. And, and he would let them know, if that's a problem for you, you don't want to come to the University of Illinois. You know, he said, that's, that's how we're going to do it. So he was a guy that, man, he was sensitive about those things back in the early 90s. Good for and him. just loved the Lord, man. And so, so coaching with him was beautiful. And then I go to uh, 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 Tennessee. At that time, first it was Houston. Jeff Fisher got the head job for the Houston Oilers, so he calls me up. I, I interviewed with Jeff, and, you know, I was with him for 13 years. Great guy to work for. Once again, blessed. Every head coach I worked for, I was blessed. I had a great head coach. So I was with Jeff for 13 years, and I remember when I had the opportunity to leave, uh, at that time we were the Tennessee Titans, and go to Washington with the Redskins. Jeff told me, he said, you can finish your coaching career here. You know, he said, you, you, you can be one guy that can coach your entire career in one place. Because I was the assistant head coach, and, you know, we were doing good things there. And, you know, so he just said, man, you can finish it up here. And so, but that's not how it worked out. So then I went to Washington to be with Jim Zorn. Jim Zorn got the head job at Washington. That was a great two years for me, one of the toughest two years in coaching that I ever experienced. That experience there in Washington, you know, not to throw any shade on what was going on there, but it was, it was a tough situation. The ownership, management, it, it just wasn't right. It was oppressive. When, I walked, when you were walking that building, it, it just felt oppressive. God taught me I had to be prayed up going in there. <laughs> you had to be prayed up, man, going that place because it just, it just wasn't right <clears throat> how things were done. And I called it when we got fired after two years of mercy firing. I said, Lord, thank you. You know, thank you. Get me out of there. You know, so. It's still a black hole. Yeah, 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 it is. It is. And that's what Jeff told me. He said, he said, Sherman, I think you'd have a chance. He said, man, I think you guys would do a great job. He said, but just the way things are done there, it's yeah. going to be tough. And, but, and then when I finally, then, I saw and Jeff. And then, and then, and then. Yeah, I saw Jeff years later after, uh, now I'm back in Seattle and Jeff is coaching with the Rams. And I see Jeff 
and we're playing the Rams, and I walk down to see him, and he just turns around and smiles at me. He said, I told you so. You know, <laughs> I told you so. And uh, so, so, so then I go back to Seattle, and that was unexpected. That was a blessing, man, to go back to Seattle. I never, guys, I never wanted to go back to Seattle. And the reason I wanted to go back to Seattle because in my Christian walk, that was a wilderness experience for me. I, I just felt, man, my testimony was raggedy. You know, because Hutch had to come to me and say, man, stop telling people you're a Christian. That's the part of my testimony. I, man, I, I never wanted to go back to Seattle for that reason. I but just but the Lord wanted you back. The Lord wanted me back there. Oh, no, I'm not there. He wanted me back there. And, it, and I guess God wanted people to see, man, I came back differently than the way I left. Yeah. As I tell people when they come into church, you know, you should leave differently than the way you came in. You know, and so I, I went back differently than the way I left. And, and it was evident to people. I didn't have to say it just the way I lived it. So, mm. and then God gave me a chance to be with the guy that mentored me. He was suffering. He had prostate cancer and I was able to be there with him. And I didn't know how much that encouraged him because we were so close. When he had his first son, he named his first son Sherman. So that's, that's how close our relationship was. And so God allowed me to be there for the last three years of his life and, you know, to encourage him to be with his family. So God had different reasons for me being there. So that was just those last three years being there with Hutch's life and the seven years being with Pete Carroll, going to Super Bowls, playoffs and all that stuff was just my, my career. I was blessed in my career. That's, and you got your ring from that. Too. I got a ring. Got a ring. Haven't, haven't worn it. Uh, since 2014. I, I just don't wear it. You know, I, people say about the ring, yeah, I got one. You know, I don't wear it, but it doesn't make me any less of a, I'm still a Super Bowl champion. So, yeah. Hey, you got two great questions here, and okay. then we're going to end because we're, uh, we're getting uh, time sensitive. Give the guys an update on Deland and, uh, and also kind of your present ministry and your uh, uh, endeavors, the okay. influence you have. Well, right now, Deland is coaching running backs at Notre Dame. You know, they had a rough start. Hopefully they're getting it on track there a little bit. But, uh, you know, so he left uh, University of Illinois to go to Notre Dame to be with Indiana. Marcus. Indiana. He left Indiana to go to Notre Dame to be with Marcus Freeman. And so uh, he's having a great experience there. You know, like I said, difficulties right now. And he wants his desire is to be a head coach. Yes. Elon. Yeah. He, you never wanted to be a head coach. You, I always felt like I was content doing what I was doing. I, I wanted to be the best running back coach that I could be. And if that's what God had for me, then God would open the door. But I never wanted to be lacking contentment in doing what I'm doing because I'm pursuing something else. I said, I'm going to just be the very best I can be. So I, I even said this to Dylan. There's a difference between contentment and complacency. And I said, I'm not going to be complacent, but I'm going to be content in doing what I'm doing. And when the opportunity, God knows the plan he has for my life. And if that's it, then God hears how you're going to do it. But I'm not running after that. I'm preparing for it. And if the door gets open, cool. If not, I'm good. I'm good with that. So Dylan wants to be a head coach, and so if it happens for him, I said, but just be content, do the best you can be, be, be the best running back coach you can be, and God will, God will, he'll open the doors if that's the door He has for you. Mm -hmm. So he's at Notre Dame, doing great, and um, you know, just hopefully they they keep it going, and I just want to see him grow in his in his relationship with the Lord also. Yeah. And so, uh, and as for me, you know, when God took me out of coaching, uh, I'm still coaching. I just felt last night what I did, man. I was coaching. I tell people when I get to speak, I just say last night, I'm getting ready to coach you up a little bit, you know, coach you up. That's all coaching is, is teaching. You know, that's all it is, is instructing. You're a coach, you know. You get up, your pastor, I'm saying, he is a coach. He's coaching you. You know, you can get into it. You can go in, your, your kids can go into school and they can call the English teacher the English coach, the math coach, the science coach, you know. So I'm coaching. It just got it. Now I'm just standing in front of men instead of football players that are presently playing. I know we got some old football players in here, so I don't want to insult you because <laughs> some of you probably still feel like you can play. So, you know, um, so but but God has still allowed me to coach yeah. and the ministry. This thing that's going on with this movie has just been phenomenal. Doc Evans said it. God's going to use it for his glory and how it's being used. is just something I never imagined would happen. And your story here, the same thing that you guys are saying here, I was in Katy, Texas a couple weeks ago. Honestly, they're saying the same thing in Texas. And this guy is telling me about a ministry that he has in seven other countries where this movie is being shown in seven other countries. Awesome. He just said, man, it's, so this guy told, so man, God is using this story all over the world. And so I just want you to know the fire that I hear here, 
when I was in Katy, Texas, and this guy was talking about his church, it's like powerhouse church. So they got powerhouse churches all over the country and in other countries. And he said, man, this video is out in you know, Peru, and he's just telling me Africa. He's just telling me all the different places. And so God is allowing me to, if I can come out of encouragement throughout my story and then talk about identity, our identity in Christ like I did last night, that's because that's where it starts, us understanding who we are. Every problem that we have, it begins there. You got to trace it back and say, don't you know who you are? <clears throat> Your identity in Christ is supposed to impact everything you do. You know, one of the things I've always admired about Sherman, this dates back when he was even a player. He, the guy brings energy. And, uh, you know, you're at a time in your life where you could say, man, I've done everything I need to do and I can check out here and kind of enjoy. But you are, I sense more energy now than you've even had during your coaching days because you see some eternal things that, oh, that, that, yeah. we're, that we can see yes. in your life. So thank you for your energy. Well, thank you. So what's, uh, what's, what, what's one of your favorite promises from God? There's the last question. And how can we pray for you and your family in this new season, mm -hmm. this new season that God's got you in? Well, I just think one of the promises from God, really, is Psalms 128, you know, where God says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, you know. He says, you will surely eat what your hands will work for. You will be happy and it will go well for you. Then he talks about your family. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like young olive trees around your table. And he says, surely the man who fears the Lord will be blessed in this way. Then he talks about you'll be blessed in Jerusalem and Zion, and you'll see your children's children. So God has fulfilled the promises. I'm seeing my wife. She's a fruitful vine. Her ministry, I'm seeing her grow and become the woman of God that God wants her to be. I'm seeing my children, you know, how they're fruitful and how the things that they're doing. So God has fulfilled those promises to me, you know, and just in my own individual life, how God has allowed me to be taking a guy that was rebellious, disobedient, you know, if, if there's hope for me, if God can use me, God can use anyone. If, you, if God gets your heart and say, you say, God, I want to be the man of God you want me to be. I know, that's why I tell God, you know my heart. God, you know my heart. I want to be the man of God that you want me to be. I, I want to serve you. You know, I want, I want to be a difference maker for the kingdom. I want you to be glorified in my words, my work, my worship, my conversation, my conduct, my character, being intentional about it, getting my mind right, setting my mind on saying, God, I want to serve you. I want to make a difference. And so uh, that's the promises that God has given me. And so I'm, that's, I hold God to his promises. When we got fired in Washington, Jim Zorn gets fired. I'm driving home, guys. I'm driving home. It's 3 o'clock in the morning because we played our last game in San Diego. And we're fired. I know we're fired. And I'm driving home. And I quote Ephesians 2.10. I'm in the car. God, you said. And I'm your workmanship <laughs> created in Christ Jesus to do good works that you prepared ahead of time for me to do. I said, now you said that. I'm this is me. I'm in, I'm talking. If somebody would look in the car, they said, that guy's going crazy. <laughs> and I'm in the car and I'm screaming, show me the work you have for me to do. Show me the work. You said, I'm your workmanship. You said this works for me to do. Show me the works. And that's what I did. I said, God, that's why I keep saying, God, show me the works. Because you said it. Amen. And I hold God to his word. And he's been faithful. Wow. How can, we pray? How can we pray for you? Man, just pray that, you know, just continue to glorify God in all that we do. Pray, you know, just I, I, specifically and generally, man, that God will be glorified in, in everything that I do and that the ministry and that men will be encouraged, women, whoever hears the word. Uh, I guess my prayer is like Paul prayed, what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 19. He said, pray for me that I, when I, the a message be given to me that when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. And he said, pray that I'll be bold enough to speak like I should. So that's how I pray. Pray, man, that, I, that God give me a message, you know, that I boldly proclaim the gospel for Christ. That's, that's so good. Amen. Hey, guys, thanks for being here. This was, this was, this was awesome. Reminder to our Zoom guys and to you guys that uh, last night's session on YouTube, Chris will have this up on YouTube. We're going to do a redo of this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be at those 25 coaches at lunch today. Pray for that. Uh, some of you know that uh, Sherman's going to be with the Kansas City Chiefs players and wives, girlfriends tonight. Very mm -hmm. intimate session. Yeah. Uh, perfect uh, venue. Uh, he, he's, he knows Kerry Casey. I don't think you've ever met Mar Marcellus. I have met Marcellus. So he's going to meet Marcellus mm -hmm. tonight. Marcellus is the chaplain. Uh, that's going to be special. And, of course, we've got our golf tournament on Thursday. And 
Greg's church tomorrow night. And yeah. uh, Greg, you're up here doing what I'm doing. Uh, it's going to be great. And so thank you for being Thanks, part of our Zoom. Thanks for being part. Mm -hmm. Let me pray for us and, uh, and just thank you again for being here. Lord, thank you for this uh, beautiful morning you've given us. It's been so good to just uh, have a, 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 a dynamic, energizing conversation based on who you are in our life. And uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, we know you and that you know us and you have plans uh, mm. to prosper us, not to fail us, plans to give us a future and a hope. And Lord, that's our hope is in you. And thank you, Lord, for the, the blessing that uh, Sherman has been to us. Thank you for the blessing that you've put on he and his family, his kids, grandkids. Lord, your story is all over this, your story of glory. And we're just so grateful that we get a chance to see that firsthand today. Lord, bless this time. Bless uh, what we're about to do in the, in the hours ahead with the coaches, with the Chiefs players, with more men, more women, more teens over the next, uh, next 72 hours. Lord, be glorified. Mm. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you Zoom guys too. All right. See you.